Before we get started, we'd like to give a huge thank you to our sponsors, Lawmatix and CallRail. Conrad. Yeah. I understand that you are headed back to school like the movie. I <laughs> I have my final exams in uh in a week. And what are you studying? I am studying OEC, which is Outdoor Emergency Care, which is essentially the class required to become a member of the Volunteer Ski Patrol. Well, I could have used your services. I would have flown you out here because my son got stitches. Are you now certified to... Don't do stitches. Don't do stitches or injections. No, no. Just tourniquets? uh, We do tourniquets. We do all sorts of stuff, but stitches are well. I'm not sure I could stitch up a kid even if I had been trained in that. That's another level. What happened to James? He was flinging his head around, as toddlers do, and flung it into the corner of a coffee table. But he is since fully repaired and stitched up and stitches out. So um, cool. Well, I look forward to uh, at some point being good enough to snowboard to be able to cat snowboard with you <laughs> and have you stitch me up if need or tourniquet me if I need it. I, I hope I never have to. If That's a, a layer of intimacy with you that I don't aspire <laughs> to, my friend. I love you dearly. If it needs to happen, I'm there. But let's not Thank get you. there. Let's avoid that. So what's in the news today? All right. We have the brand spanking new, hot off the press, squeaky clean, Clio Legal Trends Report. And most exciting. One of the first people I met in this industry was Carolyn Elephant, and she's going to be joining us today to talk about Google My Business, virtual offices, and the nightmare that that creates for the small solo practitioner. Let's hear some music. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice. Here on Legal Talk Network. All right, so welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Today we're going to jump straight into the news. So the Clio Cloud Conference, hopefully last time you were listening to the podcast, you were also attending the Clio Cloud Conference. We've got some legal trends reports coming out to you. And additionally, Bedlam launching November 10 and 11. We'd love to have you there. Join us at bedlamconference.com. Me and Guy are going to be sharing all the goodies, all the ways that we make our clients successful. And speaking of the Clio Legal Trends Report, We've got a new legal trends report for 2021, which means a new legal trends report minute. So we're very excited. This will be the first legal trends report minute from the 2021 legal trends report. Hot off the press. We hot off the press following the Clio Cloud Conference of the same year. And according to research in the 2018 Legal Trends Report, only 23% of consumers were open to the idea of working with a lawyer remotely. This year, however, 79% of survey respondents saw the option to work remotely with a lawyer as an important factor that would have a positive influence on their decision to hire that lawyer. Online payments, 66% are a top choice, followed by automated payments at 61% and payments via mobile at at 61% with respect to payment options. It's not to say that clients expect a fully remote legal experience. In fact, 67% said they would look for a lawyer offering both remote and in-person options when searching for an attorney. And this figure increased to 79% among consumers who had hired a lawyer in the past. To learn more about these opportunities and much more for free, download Clio's Legal Trends Report at clio.com forward slash trends. That's Clio spelled C-L-I-O. Yeah, I was looking at these. The way this was worded is really interesting. It's more dramatic than it actually looks. In 2018, 23% of consumers were open to the idea. Recently, 79%, it's an important factor, right? It's a hiring factor. This is a massive shift in the way that we deal with, with attorneys. It's really, really striking. And I guess, you know, If you look back at the podcast we did two years ago, it was all like, how do we deal with COVID? How do we deal with remote? How do I set up Zoom? There was people writing stuff like that. This is just par for the course at this point in time. And it's a preference, which is fascinating. And speaking of attorneys, 
We are very grateful to have an attorney with us today. Well, technically, I'm an attorney, but I'm not a practicing attorney. Carolyn Elephant has been so gracious with her time to join us today to talk legal trends report and also help us navigate some uh, Google My Business issues that are coming up. Carolyn, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Thank you. Very exciting to, to be here and talking to both of you. So I, I know you're very familiar with Clio and the Legal Trends Report. I know that you've published on topics Clio and, and, and you know, you're the, the patron saint of solo lawyers uh, is probably the best way I can think of to put it. Tell us what you think. What did you see in the Legal Trends Report or about the Legal Trends Report in general that catches your eye? So I, I did, the, the remote statistic was a takeaway. It's hard for me to say, I, I agree with Conrad that it's a big shift, but I think we've seen that shift with other types of providers too. I mean, people have been going to doctors remotely or figuring out ways to do like drive-by COVID tests and then calling their doctor and doing telemedicine. And so I think that consumers are being accustomed to that. So what we're seeing in legal again is as usual, the tail wagging the dog rather than necessarily being leaders. But it was it was refreshing to see. And I think this kind of gets at those naysayers who always thought you had to have a fancy office and a client coming in because otherwise you wouldn't be taken seriously. I think this kind of puts that myth to rest. The statistic in this report that always intrigues me, though, is the one that has to do with the lawyers only bill 2.5 hours a day. First of all, I wrote a blog post several years ago, I think when the first Clio report came out about how they came to that conclusion and what exactly they were measuring. I mean, whether it was measuring flat fees or contingency fees or hourly bills and how that number came about. And my second question was, is that such a bad thing? I mean, everybody reveres the Tim Ferriss book, The 4-Hour Workweek. So, I mean, <laughs> two point five hours a day, you're you're... That's three times what Tim Ferriss thinks you should uh, you should be working. Um, I mean, it really goes to what you're doing with those 2.5 hours. If you're sitting at your desk and eyeballing two wills that a paralegal drafted for you at you know three thousand dollars a pop, you're making six thousand dollars in those 2.5 hours, and that's what six thousand times five. That's thirty thousand dollars a week. I mean, I, I'd work 2.5 hours a day for that. So. I'm not really sure what that number is supposed to prove. I mean, I know I know what it's supposed to prove. It's supposed to show that lawyers are so encumbered by administrivia that they're spending the other 5.5 hours or 10.5 hours of their day, you know, writing down how many hours they build or, or, or sending notes by pencil or, or carrier pigeon or something like that. But, you know, it, it's never made any sense to me. And I, I don't... It, nobody ever discusses it. People just quote that to show how solo and small firms are struggling. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case unless we have more information about what's happening with that time. Do you so. suggest that that could be aspirational? Like, can I get down to two and a half hours, right? <laughs> right, yes. I mean, think that through, right? Yeah, I think that, uh, you've given us a lot of things to think about here. And the, the feedback that I've given them many times as well is, is like at the very least, You've got to segment between, you know, business model or billing model, right? Because, right. you know, there's assuming that it's everybody's billing hourly. And, yep, a lot of people are. But as you mentioned, contingency fees. So, I, you know, I, I'm kind of like you got to break this down by billing and probably practice area. And, and really, and the other thing that you bring up here that has come up a ton is the whole conversation about pricing. And again, if you've evolved to a to be able to deliver some form of alternative pricing model, I'll show my bias for value-based pricing. But to your point, if you're delivering value to a client and you're doing it more efficiently, working less to deliver more value to a client should be aspirational to use Conrad's word. So I think some clarity around that I think would be very helpful. Carolyn, I want to ask you a question. You used the word administrivia, which I love. Mm -hmm. You know, as the godmother of the solo practitioner, mm -hmm. what are the, and we're going to shift a little bit off of Cleo here, but what are some of the best ways that you know, like over and over again, for reducing that administrivia in a small law firm practice? I'd love to, you know, if you were to say, hey, lawyers, do X, Y, or Z, this works. And I've seen this over and over again. Where would you go with that? 
So that's a really good question. I mean, some of it, of course, is dependent on practice. I mean, certainly sure. I would delegate or hire as soon as possible with either like a virtual assistant or a paralegal just to gather documents and store them in one place. I mean, just having some online cloud-based storage where you keep all of your materials instead of having to download something from a court website every single time, you know, that's an obvious uh, time saving. Using automation where it makes sense and I think that you have to have a certain level of volume in your practice to make automation make sense. I mean, it can take longer to automate a court form for, you know, if you're just practicing in one particular court and you have to automate that particular form, it's going to take more time right. and you're not going to get it back if you don't use it. But I mean, to me, flat fee billing gets rid of so much of that administrivia because you've got a price, you quote it up front, you send an invoice for either 100% of it or 50% paid up front, 50% in the middle, you know, the or 50%, 40%, 10% at the end, and it's done. I mean, that is how I have saved so much time. You just get Get rid of even reviewing the hours and, and even right. with hours, even with automatic invoices and, and clock timers and things like that. I mean, I've got to say, I'm not really up to date on that because I just, I just don't use that stuff. But even with all of that, it still takes time. So I really think that changing the business model in some ways is really the best way to get rid of a lot of these administrative issues. Before we jump to break, What's the tipping point or what's the thing that can push an attorney into changing that business model, right? Like when, when are you ready to move away from that billable hour? What, what's, you know, jump off the cliff. What should you be looking for as in a law firm? It's hard to say. I think it's really a mindset. There are some attorneys who really prefer the billable hour. And I think they prefer it because their whole business model is based and leveraged on it. They bill by the hour. They have associates who are doing more work. I've seen some practice management advisors encourage people to comb through their files and find more work that can be done and then hire somebody to do it and yep. bill that out and bill more time. So that's really more a mindset issue because as long as you're thinking about a file as something to squeeze more hours out of, you're really Really never going to change over. So I think you just have to have, um, just make a mindset shift that you're delivering a result or a solution, a deliverable. That's what people are paying for. And right. that's what we're accustomed to seeing in, you know, any other kind of contract. you pay for deliverables. And so I think if you think of it more along those lines, you can start thinking about ways to develop this flat fee system to make it more profitable for you and start thinking of ways that you can define your scope of service. I mean, you can, you can offer different products. You don't have to offer the divorce where you respond to 75 right. motions to compel. You can have your flat fee cover three motions and then do an add on. If, if there are more start thinking through your case, but it's really a mindset shift. And there are some attorneys who are still just very much wedded to the billable hour, because I think at the end of the day, their profit model is, is based on it. Right. And, and I'll tell you, Conrad, in the stories I hear for the lawyers that have made the jump, I was just talking to this, he's an employer side lawyer. It's when they see, to Carolyn's point out the mindset, it's when they actually are able to decouple the amount of time that they spent yeah. to the value that they've created for the client. So in this particular case, it took them, you know, they filed, I think they filed one motion and a case was dismissed and the client was like, oh my gosh, like you just saved my business. And th my friend was like, this was, it took me 30 minutes and I billed him at right. my hourly rate for 30 minutes. And obviously <laughs> right. this client would have paid a lot more for that. And it was like, you know, and vice versa, where uh, a lot of lawyers that I've seen that are unbillable and they see somebody else, they see another lawyer deliver some kind of value to a client in a way. And they ask him, you know, oh, you know, how much did you bill for that? And, you know, they talk about how they're actually, well, the billing's not tied to the amount of time yeah, I spent. That's right. When they see that, that I think is the first time they kind of, that mindset shift begins to take hold. I had a great, and we're going to cut to break. We're waffling on a way off schedule already. But <laughs> you As remember, I asked you the other day, do you think David Baker would give me an hour of his time? I offered him $1,000 and he said, no, it's 16 for the whole product. And he's right, right? right? And he, he would not spend an hour with me because he's got something else. He doesn't sell time. He doesn't sell time. He sells value. And the value is facilitating that transaction. Anyway, let's cut to break. And we're going to start on the opposite side of this conversation. We're going to talk about 
Google My Business, reviews, small law firms, and how to play in that game. Smart firms use CallRail to track where every lead comes from. PPC, LSA, organic search, or even offline ads. CallRail tells you which channels drive your best leads. CallRail even integrates with your favorite CRM or practice management tools to help manage your leads and see the ROI on your marketing investments. Know exactly which marketing tools work. Plans start at 45 bucks a month. We recommend CallRail to every single one of our clients. Go to callrail.com slash lunch hour now and try it for free. If you're like a lot of lawyers that we talk to, you're trying to grow your firm, but you're having trouble doing more in a day than just managing your systems. So what you really need is a simple system that can easily identify where your profitable leads are coming from, analyze practice performance, and easily sync up matters. Now I've got to admit, I'm both an investor and advisor to Lawmatics. And the reason is I'm super excited what Matt's building over there. So you don't have to change your entire system. Lawmatics easily integrates with my case, Clio, Smokeball, Rocket Matter, and lots of others. So take a test drive today with Lawmatics to make client intake easier lawmatics.com welcome back so now we want to talk about google my business and virtual law practices so kind of setting this up some of the big issues and we'll, we're going to we want to go deeper on this we think this is a really important subject and it actually this segment emerged from a conversation that carolyn conrad and i had a little while ago. So Google My Business, big picture, it's the free tool you can go register for, put your business information on Google. It's going to take up some serious real estate for searches on your name and your firm name. And it also powers these local pack results, which are the little map packs that show up in search results for searches, you know, practice area plus lawyer. So divorce lawyer in Chicago, that kind of thing. And they have guidelines, and we'll, we'll list these in the show notes too, but the short version is, is that Google, for the Google My Business program, you're either basically bucketed into a brick and mortar, meaning you have a physical office location, you've got an address where you actually receive, in this context, clients, you, you know, service clients at your location, or you're a service area business where, hey, you don't actually serve clients at a physical location. And so you create your service area and you remove your address. And it got us thinking about how this impacts various lawyers and solos and smalls particularly, because in so, you know the instant thing that we think about is, is like, well, if you don't have a brick and mortar, are you disadvantaged in terms of visibility? Are you disadvantaged in terms of like the features that you might have for your business? And so we wanted to kind of open that conversation up and... You know, really, I think the TLDR is is that there are some serious competitive disadvantages to firms, especially solos and smalls, and those that don't have physical office locations. Who wants to start to navigate some of this stuff? Well, I think one really important thing to note here is these service area businesses were typically set up for people like plumbers or locksmiths, right? And so it they was come to you. They come to you right? Which is also not really the law firm model, right? And so the law firm model, especially in these days of Zoom and COVID, it's struggling in here. And the solos, I think, are particularly hit hard, which is exactly why we wanted to bring in Carolyn to talk about this. Carolyn, as you've talked to law firms, especially smaller solos, dealing with Google My Business, what are some of the biggest frustrations that they're seeing? So, I asked around about whether Google's policy of penalizing uh, or making it more difficult for a solely virtual office to get some real estate on Google My Business had impacted them. And there had been a couple of firms that had gone from brick and mortar to virtual. And when they did, they found that their reviews weren't displaying anymore. They weren't showing up on search anymore. And so those are the kind of responses that I received from them. And that's that's something that's very troubling. And the reason it's troubling is because a lot of virtual firms, not all, but many virtual firms are set up with the express intent of serving underserved parts of the population by making legal services more affordable or serving people who are very busy and can't come into a law office. And many times 
that target audience for the virtual firm are also people who don't necessarily have a friend who has used an attorney or has hired an attorney. And so that person can't get a referral. I mean, in many cases, if you're dealing with other populations, they can you know, talk to a friend, get a referral. So they're going to go to the internet and these are the providers that they're looking for and they can't find them because they've been displaced by these big brick and mortar shops that are hogging up the first three lines or the first page of the internet. So, I mean, to me, this is, this is an access to justice problem. And what's interesting about this is that a lot of the voices we traditionally associate with access to justice, like legal zoom or document automation, Mm -hmm. they don't really care about this issue because they have the money from their VC backing to buy paid search or do, do whatever it is you need to do to be on the first page of Google. So this is not an issue for them, but in terms of people who are interested in access to justice with individuals being able to find local attorneys to help with domestic violence cases or small wills or, or bankruptcy from purely virtual practice, they need to be able to find virtual law firms online. And that's something that, that isn't happening. And it's, yeah, I've always been a fan of Google. I always like this idea of online search, but it's it's kind of startling that it can be blocked this way. And I guess the last point I wanted to make is just that, you know, I mean, solo and small firms have always been disadvantaged financially when it comes to publicity. I mean, when you think about the mm-hmm. yellow pages, there's always some usually all white male law firm on the back, the back cover, you know, call 1-800-CALL-ME. And solos couldn't afford that kind of listing. But I think there's a difference because the yellow pages were not as dominant as Google is. Google has become kind of the default place where people look for attorneys online. So the impact of not being able to compete, I think, is much broader. And it goes beyond just not being able to spend money, but being able to engage in a service that Google is providing that's supposed to make people more accessible and is working against these virtual law firms. Hey, Guy, I'm going to ask a clarifying question. Let's talk through the virtual law firm. Why does the virtual law firm not show up in local from the Google perspective, right? Why is that not really a thing? Well, I don't know that it doesn't at all. You know, when we were doing our anecdotal research in preparation, I think we noticed that, you know, the overwhelming majority of listings that showed up for any of these, call them non-brand queries, so practice area plus lawyer plus city, they were brick and mortars. And so, you know, I think Google's struggling with this dichotomy of service area in these different contexts. Because if you do a search for locksmith, as you mentioned, you're getting all service area businesses. There's no real, there's no issue there, right? Right. And so like Google's showing, Google's thinking as, (laughs) when I say Google's Mm -hmm. thinking, I always kind of laugh because it's like their thinking (laughs) is terrifying. But in any event, um, Google's thinking, somebody searches for a lawyer, they're looking for a brick and mortar law firm. They're, that's what they're looking for. And so we're going to show them firms for the most part, not always, but for the most part, firms that have physical brick and mortars. You know, the other thing that came out of this when we first had this conversation and didn't dawn on me, but is, is a very one-to-one is the issue of Google has published that review count yeah. is a factor in ranking. And so, you know, this, Conrad, you can kind of take this away because you brought this point up, but the big firms, they have a tremendous competitive advantage yeah. because they can just, gen- they can do in more volume. They're going to generate more reviews. And so you can be the best solo lawyer in the world who's delivering tremendous value for clients, but you're only taking on five clients a year, uh, client a year. Yeah, at the risk of co-opting John Morgan's, frankly, awful... <laughs> Uh, new tagline, size matters. When it comes to review count, honestly, size does matter. It further disadvantages the small law firm. And I mean, Carolyn, this is one of the things that, that you and I talked about the other day. It's just, it's very hard for the solo practitioner who sees 10 matters a month to compete with the Walmart of law that's seeing a thousand when reviews matter and the volume of reviews matter. Yeah. And, you know, the irony is, is you can sometimes if you look at a small law firm's page, you see kind of the reviews that are provided. They're very in-depth and they give a lot of information about how this attorney helped them with their practice. And they're much more informative than some of these almost drive-by reviews, which are the result of, you know, sending or texting emails or, or 
messages to people to to review the firm or they review the firm for just you know making a phone call and answering a question but not necessarily hiring them so it's a perverse problem too because it leads to people trying to gather reviews which are not necessarily inaccurate but maybe inaccurate because they're situations that are out of context and so Reviews can be a very powerful tool to communicate information. Um, And in fact, in the Clio Trends Report, which was really interesting and surprised me, is that according to their study, they found that personal reviews ranked just a smidge, a couple of percentage points higher than personal referrals an individual's decision to hire an attorney, which really surprised me, but it reinforces how important people consider these reviews to be. And so if they're not accurate, that's that's a big problem. Right. And I'll even do you one worse is there are plenty of uh, I, I, lawyers I, out there <laughs> that are spending a lot of money to have fake, completely fake, fraudulent reviews on their profiles. And, you know, lawyers hear that and they're like, oh, lawyers wouldn't do that. Like, sadly, we know that they do. <laughs> oh, yes, um, they do. The other th- issue that this kind of comes into, and Conrad and I know this because we we look at call tracking reports. And, you know, we I tell clients all the time, like, you can rank number one all day, but if the person in the number two spot has more and higher quality reviews than you, your phone's not going to ring because these reviews do matter so much. But, like, let's face it, Google's an ad machine. They're an ad platform. 99% of their revenue comes from people clicking ads. There are ads in the local pack, so that's a thing. But when you're talking purely about Google My Business, it's completely organic. You're not paying Google for your uh, visibility there. But it seems like if they're going to put this out, they're going to put business information out there. And it's, you know, because they're the one we see all the time is people have, you know, fake business names and and lead generation companies will create fake listings and, and fake phone numbers. And, you know... It's bad enough when that stuff's going on for like, I got, you're looking for like someone to fix your car. But it's that much worse when you're dealing with what Google would call your money or your life when you're talking about lawyers and doctors. In fact, there's a case, we talked about this before out of Pennsylvania where a client is suing the firm because they claim that they reviews. relied on a, a fake review. But it, it seems to me that there needs to be some accountability by the platform in this case. If you're going to put this information out there, that you got to bear some kind of accountability. But uh, at the same time, then people say Section 230, we don't want platforms being liable. I don't know. So I think the interesting thing, to bring this back to Carolyn's point about the Yellow Pages, I actually remember, Carolyn, this is a conversation you and I had in Florida. I can't even remember where we were. This is a long time ago. Yes, where I know. We were I talking know. about the internet opening up opportunity for the small and solo, like the tech leaning, savvy, small solo, the internet opened up that opportunity and it had evolved away from that. And I still remember this quote. I even may have thrown this in my book where you said the internet is the new back cover of the yellow pages, right? I still remember that. So Carolyn, the firms that are are being successful, the local firms, the solos, the smaller firms that are being successful in local, right? And with Google My Business. Do you have any feel of where it's working for them or where it's not? What are the things that are making the difference for that local firm? I mean, one of the things, areas where I see firms succeeding locally is having a real local presence. So there are a lot of mom-owned firms for family law or for estate planning, and they kind of get into the mom communities, the mom social media groups, the in-person, or when we used to have in-person PTA meetings and baby and me and giving out business cards and speaking to local mom groups. I see that groups like that, particularly in the area where I live, are very successful. The problem with that is, is those types of groups and those types of activities attract certain people. And many times, again, women who are underserved, who are uh, working full time and raising children don't have access to that. And so I'm not sure how those populations are targeted, but but usually the people, you know, the smaller firms I've seen are successful, have very successful social media presences, Instagram, some of the newer ones, maybe TikTok for younger people, and are really doing more of a 
community issue. I've, I've seen, you know, there's been a lot of articles out now on the creator economy. And I think that the creator economy and the way that creators are monetizing their talent and their value is very similar, or has some lessons for how very small firms can do it. And one thing that it talks about with creators is they target community or they build community, not audience, because audience is so big and so broad that you really have to have money and numbers to be able to compete in that. So I think I think with virtual law firms or smaller solo and small firms, the way they have the most success is by really drilling down, focusing on a community or target audience and just like targeting the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah, that is such a thank you so much for sharing that. And I will include in the show notes, Seth Godin talks a lot about this and he has a post called Clusters that I uh, <laughs> reference a lot of times, but it's exactly this, right? It's you want to know what the, you know what you do? You end around Google altogether. Forget about Google, right? Let the people that are going to spend the big bucks on pay-per-click and all that kind of stuff, go do that, but build your community. You know, it's almost like full circle because you're going back to the things that we did a hundred years ago. Mm. It's nurturing relationships. It's being there in your community, supporting the causes and passions of others in your community. As you mentioned, you know, these social networks, they provide us a platform to be able to do this stuff online now. So you don't actually have to go to the you know, the in-person events in your community, but each of these organizations or, or affinity groups or whatever you want to call them, they tend to have a a group or a, a community that's that's growing on some online platform too. So I think that's fantastic advice. And that I think that's the way to short circuit the system. If, you know, don't go out and just be like, I, I'm, I'm beholden to Google. Let's go actually find other ways to build brand, to build reputation, to build relationships in a more traditional sense, but using technology. We were talking about this the other day at the agency. There is a job description somewhere in the future for really solid legal marketing agencies to help local firms become more engaged in the community, right? I don't mm. think it comes naturally to many lawyers. It comes very naturally to a very small number. And I really believe there is a job function. It's a combination of PR, social outreach, relationship building, and like sponsorship dollars and stuff like like I, there is that job that is part of the legal marketing world somewhere between one and four years from now. I, I do believe that. Next time on Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, we're gonna go deeper into Google My Business and Section 230. I think it'll be a really, really fascinating conversation. And we would like you to help us build our community if at all possible. Leave reviews, reach out on social, share how amazing Guy and Carolyn are. terrible. In spite of their co-host. We'd love to hear your feedback, negative or otherwise. And if you are from Google, please do not send this on to anyone who you work with because Guy just told you, the entire audience, to do an end around of the Google services. So, And Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time and insight on this topic and uh, great chat with you. Yes, thank you for having me. It's nice and fast and efficient. (laughs) And thank you, dear listeners, again, for joining us for another episode of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Uh, As always, please do subscribe, review, comment, hashtag LHLM. We'd love to hear your feedback. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. I guess I ran out of juice. (laughs) Workers' Comp Matters is a podcast dedicated to exploring the laws, the landmark cases, and the true stories that define our workers' compensation system. 
I'm Judd Pierce, and together with Alan Pierce, we host a different guest each month as we bring to life this diverse area of the law. Join us on Workers' Comp Matters on the Legal Talk Network.